Purpose.com, there's a donate button. Sometimes we slip up and say donut button, but it's, it's, it's not, it's a donate button. These chairs are made a little easier on the ushers. They don't have to hand out the envelopes now. Let's stand to our feet. Let's hold our Bibles up and let's say this together. We invite the internet audience to say this with us. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Bible. I believe the Bible. It's your word. It's the truth. It's a love letter from you to me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated and turn with me, please in the Gospel of uh, Mark, to Mark chapter 10. And uh, I'm going to be bringing you a message this morning on the faith of Barnabas. We're going to be looking at how this blind man, Barnabas, received his sight. And as we examine his faith, we're going to learn about faith and going to grow in faith ourselves. Dwight L. Moody said, I prayed for faith and thought someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. He said, one day I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I had closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now opened my Bible and began to study, and faith has been growing ever since. And so that's what we're going to do together. We're going to open our Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 10 beginning in verse 46 and we're going to study the Bible we're going to study the faith of Barnabas and as we study his faith we're going to grow in faith. How many of you believe that? Can you say amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> Let's begin reading in verse 46 Now when they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude blind Barnabas the son of Timaeus sat by the road begging and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. And so I'm going to bring a few points as we examine the faith of Barnabas, a few points about faith that we can apply in our own lives. First of all, faith knows who Jesus is. Barnabas cried out, Jesus, son of David, that was a title for the Messiah. He knew this was the Messiah, the son of God that was, that was walking by. He knew who Jesus was. You know, there's some people, they heard about Jesus, but they really don't know who he is. There's some people that think Jesus was just an enlightened teacher, like other enlightened teachers or philosophers, and that some think of Jesus as, well, he was a, a, a great teacher who brought uh, good principles to us. Well, he did all that, but he's more than a teacher. He's, he is the son of God. He's the son of David. They knew, he, he knew who Jesus was. And we need to get it resolved in our heart. If we want to grow in faith and be men and women of faith, we need to know who Jesus is. That's a powerful name, the name of Jesus. Amen. And we need to have a relationship with him. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. We need to know more than just know about him. We need to know him. Amen. Well, born in Mass, he was crying out, Jesus, son of David. He, he had heard about Jesus and knew who Jesus was. And then notice that faith 
uh, cries out to Jesus. You know, if, if we want to have faith, we need to use the name of Jesus and cry out to Jesus. He's as close as the mention of His name. He said, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I was in a meeting in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, preaching at a church, and a woman came in and broke up the whole meeting. She came in and she said, uh, I've got to tell what happened. She said, I was going down the freeway and these two 18-wheelers just started closing in on me and I was trapped between them and it happened so fast. She said, all I had time to do was cry out, Jesus! And she said, when I did that, those trucks just parted and my life was spared. You know, there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've shared this before. Shore and I were walking uh, when we lived in Kingwood years ago. We were walking. We saw out of the corner of our eye this uh, something run out of the back of one yard into the back of another yard. It looked like a large, it was so fast we couldn't hardly tell what it was, but it was a large dog. And we didn't think about it. We were just walking uh, up the hill uh, there on one of the roads and we heard this growling behind us and we turned around and there was this huge uh, Doberman pincher. And I know there's, there's two varieties I understand of Doberman pinchers. One are real friendly and docile, but there's one uh, uh, strain that's very fierce. This one was obviously of the fierce strain and it we turned around and that dog was right on us and it showing its teeth and I mean, it was, you could see the flexing in its muscles in here. It was getting ready to lunge at us. And, and it was just by the Holy Spirit that we did this so quickly. We just reacted. Both of us cried out, Jesus! <laughs> and when we said Jesus, that dog stopped you could see the look of fear on, the, I don't know if it saw a huge angel next to us or what happened, but it turned and it went, oh, 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 just running away from us, ran into the woods at the end of the road. Then I got down off of Shar's shoulders and we continued the walk. But there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. We were on an elevator in India, and they had these uh, in an Indian hotel looking for a place to stay, and they were having brownouts over there. We were on this small elevator, and so the manager of the hotel was going to show us one of the rooms, and we were crammed in there with people just shoulder to shoulder like sardines, and they had a brownout, and that elevator just froze. And Shar does not like to be in enclosed places, and uh, she said on that elevator, it's dark. The lights went out, everything, just dark. Shar cried out, In the name of Jesus, door open! That door popped open just like that. I mean, it just popped open. And we stepped right on off. And after he showed us the room, he said, Would you like to take the elevator down? We said, No, we'll walk down the steps. Thank you, walk down the stairs. I'm telling you, I believe that was a supernatural reaction to the, to the supernatural name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. And sometimes that's all you have time for is you get the name of Jesus out there. I'm telling you, something's going to happen when you use the name of Jesus. Amen. So uh, he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Faith cries out to Jesus. And uh, you know, uh, I, re I read this by Dr. Tony Evans, and I thought it was real good, speaking about the name of Jesus. And I just want to, it's an excerpt from uh, one of his messages. But he said, when a man gets in trouble with the law, he doesn't want a law book. The law book is important, but what he really needs is a lawyer. The lawyer is needed to reflect the law that is written in the book because the book of the law without the representative, a lawyer is just information. When a woman is sick, she wants more than just a medical book. She wants a doctor. When a potential victim is facing a criminal, they need more than the penal code. They need an officer. The Bible is a book, but Jesus personified the book in, in His person. 
And you know, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made uh, through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Amen. He is the Word of God personified. Amen. Then uh, the third, uh, the next point is found also in verse 47. Barnabas cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Faith cries out for mercy. Amen. We're, we're saved by grace through faith. Grace cries out for mercy. You know, the law is good. One thing the law tells us is that we need a, a redeemer. But the law cries out for judgment. But grace through faith cries out for mercy. James wrote that mercy triumphs over judgment. Can you say amen? The law stands there with arms folded and says, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't even think about doing that. Grace says with open arms, I'll help you not to do this. I'll help you not to do that. I'll help you with your thoughts. Amen. We need, uh, faith cries out for mercy. How many of you have ever broken the speed limit? What is it that makes us do that? I know we know better. I try to, you know, stay there, but there's something that you just don't feel right if you're not going five miles an hour. I, we've all heard they'll give you five miles an hour over, you know. There's just something that you just feel like you're, you're getting left out if you're not doing five miles over the speed limit. Come on now. Let's, don't look at me religious like that. I'm, I'm, I know all of you. You've been there, huh? Well, how many of you broke the speed limit this week? I, I'll raise both my hands. I did. I, I admit it. Let me ask you this. How many of you cried out for judgment? How many of you, when that happened, did you cry out to God and say, send a policeman to pull me over and write me a ticket? <laughs> did, did anybody do that? Did anybody say, send a policeman, Lord, write, I want, I want a ticket for this violation? No, you cried out for mercy. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Faith cries out for mercy. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, uh, uh, it's when, when Shar and I went through those years of testing in our finances, when I got born again, I was saved in the, uh, February 24th, 1985, and the oil busted hit. I had enough financial problems to bankrupt a small country. And it took us 10 years to get all that straightened out and everything. And, you know, God saw us through all of that. We paid every penny we owed. We paid the IRS five and a quarter million dollars, paid them every penny we owed them. We set it uh, as, as a goal. And uh, we had all kinds of things. I don't want to oppress you. I won't tell you all the things we had <laughs> coming against us. But God got us through uh, with all our debts paid and uh, with integrity. And I give him the glory for that. But you know, there were times we would uh, kneel beside the bed and just, it would look impossible and we would just cry out for mercy. And sometimes we would weep, kneel beside the bed and just weep and cry out and ask God for mercy. It was that difficult. But I'm telling you, it worked. Uh, after 10 years, we were debt free. And uh, we, we learned more during that 10 years than we're stronger in the area of faith and the area of finances than we would ever have been had we not had those 10 years. But you know what? We learned this too. Uh, it's okay to cry out for mercy. Faith cries out for mercy. We should never let religious pride stop us from crying out for mercy. That's, that's a characteristic of faith to cry out for mercy. That's what Barnabas did. He said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Amen. That's faith speaking when you do that. Come on now. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching the truth to you. That's what Brother Hagin used to say, wasn't it? Don't shout me down because I'm preaching the truth to you. Look in verse 48. But many warned him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Faith does not bend to worldly pressure. Faith does not compromise because of worldly pressure. Faith can get loud at times. 
Faith doesn't give in to peer pressure. Faith is not intimidated. Barnabas did not let those around him intimidate him. And then look in verse 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Faith gets the attention of Jesus. Jesus stood still because this blind man refused to be intimidated. He knew who he was. He was calling out his name. He was crying out for mercy and he refused to be intimidated and Jesus stood still. In that huge crowd, that blind man got his attention because he had faith. Amen. Faith, not religion. Faith, not political correctness. Faith gets the attention of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. This uh, community, it was a farming community, and they had been in a long drought. They hadn't had any rain for a long time, so all the uh, religious leaders uh, in the community, they all said, we're going to gather in the town square, and the local radio station announced it, and we're going to pray for rain. And they all gathered, and uh, they, they prayed, and they... Uh, shouted and uh, did all they could and the rain didn't happen. And a little boy heard about it and he called the radio station. She said, I'm going to the town square tomorrow and I'm going to pray for rain and it's going to rain. And they didn't pay a whole lot of attention to him, but there were people began to hear about it and they were watching for him. And that little boy showed up in the town square with a raincoat on and an umbrella. And he went out there and stood in the middle of the town square. He opened that umbrella up. He began to pray for rain. I mean, he had faith. He believed it was going to rain. And, and when he prayed, it started raining. The clouds formed overhead and it started pouring down rain. That little boy standing out there with his raincoat on and his umbrella up. And he had faith. He believed that God was going to send rain. Amen. Praise God. Faith is what gets the attention of Jesus. Faith, not ritual. Believing God. Amen. And then uh, verse 50 or well, 49, it says, they said be uh, to the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, when verse 50, throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. You know, they were trying to tell him, be quiet, you know, hold it down. But faith hears God rather than the world. The world will tell you, oh, well, Jesus doesn't heal today. The world will, will try to tell you that. Uh, the world will tell you if you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, you can't be delivered and set free uh, by the Holy Spirit. That's what the world will tell you. They'll tell you if you're an alcoholic, you're going to be an alcoholic forever. If you're a drug addict, you're a drug addict forever. That's what the world, uh, the world will tell you. But faith hears God rather than the world. The Bible says he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. That was what Shar prayed for me. When I was uh, bound by alcohol and drugs, she would pray that over and over again. You sent your word. She put my name in there and healed Tom Battle and delivered him from his destructions. And I made that surrender to Jesus. I had tried with willpower. That didn't do any good, but I surrendered to Jesus and I found out there was something stronger than willpower. It's called self-control. And it comes from the Holy Spirit. It's greater than any willpower that any, any man can generate through the flesh. When you surrender to Jesus Christ and, and He empowers you and changes you, you receive the fruit of the Spirit, which includes self-control. And self-control is power from the Holy Ghost. And I found I didn't have to drink anymore. I didn't have to do those drugs anymore. And He gave me the Holy Spirit, which is so much, He's so much more wonderful than any... Uh, high the devil, for counterfeit high the devil can provide. I found out that I, I had the most high God. Amen. I was high on the most high God. I didn't need those counterfeit highs of the devil. I didn't need drugs. I didn't need alcohol. I had the Holy Spirit. Amen. Faith hears God rather than the world. I was getting ready to go into the Harris County Jail ministry years ago. We used to go in uh, once a month to the Harris County Jail and minister to the inmates there. And I was sitting waiting. There was a psychiatrist waiting to go in at the same time out there. And we got to visiting. And I, 
I was sharing him my testimony and I told him how I was delivered from drugs and alcohol. He said, that's impossible. He said, that, that couldn't have happened. I said, excuse me. I said, it did happen. I said, I was one of the worst, most severe alcoholics and drug addicts I know of. And he delivered me. Excuse me, it did. He said, well, that's, that's just one of a kind. I said, he was going in. He was turning. Well, that's just uh, done normal. I said, we got lots of people in our church that have had the same thing happen to them. He was just shaking his head as he was walking in. He, you know, they had called him in there. I'm telling you, the world will tell you you can't be delivered. There used to be, there was a psychiatrist that used to have an advertisement out on the uh, freeway. Or was one was on 1960 out here. And it said, alcohol, uh, it's not your fault, but it is your problem. I used to ride by there and think, well, that guy will always have plenty of, of patience if they believe that. Because if they believe it's not their fault, they'll never come to repentance and never be truly set free. Oh, sure, lots of things happen in people's lives that might drive them to drinking. People get hurt, they get bruised and so forth. It happens to uh, everybody. But uh, when I was 13 years old and taking that first drink, nobody had to you know, hold me down and pour it down my throat. I drank it of my own uh, will and volition. And uh, w when I came to Jesus, I repented of my sins and he delivered me. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. I believe he's no respecter of persons. What he did for me, I believe he'll do for anyone. Amen. The, the world, if you listen to the world, the, the world, uh, it, rather than God, you won't find faith being activated. The world will tell you, oh, it's not your fault. You don't need to repent. You don't have to tell God you're sorry. Let me tell you, when you repent and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, deliver me from this addiction. God, I'm sorry I ever had that first drink. And you come to the cross in repentance, the Lord will deliver you. I, 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 he'll deliver anyone who will do that. The world wants to leave repentance out of the gospel message. But we've read the truth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, it wasn't just John the Baptist that preached repentance. It was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You read it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He preached repentance. That re word repentance means, uh, the, the original word, it means to make a turn. And what faith tells us is to turn away from the way of the world and turn to God. Turn to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. Have mercy on me, son of David. Amen. That's what gets deliverance. That's what gets healing. Amen. Glory to God. And I'm not saying all sickness is, is due, to, you know, due to sin. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. But I'm, I'm saying that when whatever we're going through, if it, it does involve sin, we need to be sure that we repent. Amen. Hallelujah. Faith hears God rather than the world. And notice that he threw off his coat. Blind people, they wore heavy coats in those days, thick, heavy coats to protect them from bruising and all if they bumped into things and so forth. So he had on a very heavy garment. And he, in verse uh, 50, it says, throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. We need to throw off anything that's heavy that's trying to hold us back from Jesus. We just need to throw it off and run toward Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. We need to throw off any hindrances that would uh, keep us or slow us down from calling out to Jesus. Maybe the, maybe the devil has intimidated someone here or within the hearing of my voice over the internet that hasn't uh, run to Jesus because they think, well, I'm just not worthy. Uh, I just, I'm not good enough. Let me tell you, God's not limited by our weaknesses. He's only limited, limited by our decisions. Let me say that again. God's not limited by our weaknesses. He took care of that when he went to the cross at Calvary and took our place and took our, uh, the punishment, took our judgment on the cross at Calvary, he took care of our weaknesses. He's not limited by our weaknesses. He's only limited by our decisions, by our choices. And if we'll make that decision of faith and throw off anything that's holding us back, we'll find he's there with open arms waiting to heal us, to deliver us, to answer those prayers, to show himself strong on our behalf according to his word. Amen. Amen. Faith throws off religion. Faith throws off pride. 
Faith throws off peer pressure. Faith throws off fear. Faith runs to Jesus and throws off anything that would hinder that running to him. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Faith has no back door. I mean, when, when you believe uh, and, and, and faith is in operation, you don't look for a back door. You're just running toward Jesus. I'm sure most of y'all probably never heard of Wendy Bagwell. I'm dating myself, but he was one of the, he was a hilarious guy. He had a, a gospel team and, and just, they had a good gospel team. They sung, uh, you know, Southern gospel mostly. And he had this one woman on his team named Earlene, was kind of the head female singer. And they went all over the place. He, they were from Macon, Georgia. They went all over the place singing gospel music. They were also uh, kind of comedians too. And he, I don't even know if you can get this now, but uh, I used to have an album of his. And he told the story. It was, that was, I think this might have even been eight tracks. I don't know, but it was a long time ago. But uh, they were somewhere up in... Uh, uh, Tennessee, he said, uh, way out in the uh, sticks. And the, he, they had gotten invited to preach. And he said they went out there, said they had to run. He said it seemed like they had to run uh, cards a mile just to get power to the place. You know, they went out there to, to preach. He said they, they walked in the place and uh, said there was kind of eerie feeling in the place. And so he said they didn't think anything about these uh, you know, boxes with cloths over them in front of the pulpit. And he said he and his praise and worship team, you know, their gospel group, they got up there and said about that time, uh, a woman came and grabbed a, he grabbed a snake out of a box. Then they brought another snake. He said, they said it's seven feet long. He said, it looked like it's 17 feet long to me. It was one of those snake handling churches they had wound up in. He said, he looked to Earlene and he said, is there a back door in this place? And, uh, she said, uh, no, and he said, reckon where they want one. <laughs> I, I, I'm with him, <laughs> amen. You know, i tell you a true story. Uh, you know, we know that uh, God doesn't require us to prove our faith by taking up serpents, and, and that we don't agree with that, obviously. Thank God we don't. And that, that sign of the believer is not, it's referring to if something happened to you like happened to Paul on the uh, island of, of Malta where he was picking up sticks to put in a fire. You know, a snake bite was a real thing that, uh, uh, a danger that uh, the early, and in some countries even today, that evangelists and missionaries encounter. And just like Paul, as he was gathering those sticks for the fire, he got bit on the hand you know, and the, and the serpent was hanging from his hand and he shook it off into the fire and uh, they were waiting for him to die. Obviously, it was a venomous serpent, but he didn't die. And then they began to say he was a god. But anyway, they wound up having revival on the island. I'm sure Paul straightened them out for that. And, and they, the, uh, the, the man, uh, the father of the man who was the governor of the island got healed. And, uh, but that's what it's talking about. It's talking about uh, if you, something like that happens, you can have faith in God when you're about God's work, but you don't go out uh, asking, you know, thinking you've got to exhibit your faith by picking up a, a poisonous snake. Well, Daniel Matei, a friend of ours from Romania, he was in a church like this in Tennessee, and he said that he was, he got in, he was at a church conference in uh, Alabama, and he got invited to this church just across the border, Tennessee, to preach, and he just said yes without really thinking much about it. He said it was way out, uh, way out in the country, and he got there. This is a true story, and he was getting ready to preach, and he said uh, this, there were two boxes in front with red cloth over it, and he said the pastor was sitting behind him like this with his hands folded with this kind of smirk on his face, and he felt like he was being set up or something, and said this woman standed up and started pointing at him and saying, you're not a man of God, and pointing his, her finger, you're not a man of God. And he rebuked the woman. He said, ma'am, you're out of order. Sit down. But instead of sitting down, she walked up and she reached in one of those boxes. And Daniel, I don't guess they, I don't, well, I, I don't think they have rattlesnakes in Romania. But he was disgraced. He said it was going like that. And the, she, she was holding that rattlesnake and it was going 
And she said, if you were a man of God, you would handle this snake. He said, he looked at her and he said, ma'am, I'll be honest with you. He said he backed up, he raised his hands, he started praying in the spirit. And uh, he said, ma'am, I'll be honest with you. He said, I don't have faith to handle that snake. But he said, I got faith to do this. He pointed at that snake. He said, in the name of Jesus, die. And that snake died right in her hand. And she reached in the box and there were other snakes. They were all dead. And he said, the pastor, uh, it, it scared him so much, he leaped over the banister and him and that woman fled the church. <laughs> fled. This is a true, true story. Uh, Daniel's man started hundreds of churches all over the world. I mean, he wouldn't, uh, if he said it, it's the truth. And, and they fled the church and he uh, taught the people about what the signs of the believer really mean. And they got set free. That whole church got set free. But I, I kind of went off on a trail there and really didn't even think about you know, uh, that. But it's, here's the point. Uh, faith uh, believes God. And uh, faith doesn't try to show off and, and try to, uh, you know, it's like when Jesus was asked, to, the devil tempted Jesus, said, uh, took him to the pinnacle of the temple and said, jump off. For it is written, uh, God's, he's, God's, he's quoting 91st Psalm. You know, the devil can quote scripture. But he said, it's written, God has given his angels charge over you. But notice he, he, he was incomplete with it because if you turn to Psalm 91, it says to keep you in all your ways. And uh, Jesus looked at, at Satan. He says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And that was not the way of Jesus to do some cheap publicity stunt by jumping off the pinnacle of the temple and reading the next day in the Jerusalem Post, you know, Messiah jumps off. No, that was not the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord was the way of the cross. Amen. And so uh, faith hears God rather than the world. Faith throws off uh, hindrances and uh, faith knows what it wants. Notice this. Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabono, that I may, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. And so uh, faith knows what it wants. I remember I was at a meeting. Uh, I was asked to be one of the speakers at the, the state convention for New Mexico at Full Gospel Businessmen Convention oh, about 27, 28 years ago. And I was sitting at the table, uh, breakfast table, and there was a man sitting across from me who had to wear a back brace and walked with a cane. He was a truck driver that had been injured in an accident and he had to walk like this, and he, he had a back brace on. And he looked at me across that breakfast table with tears running down his cheeks. He said, I want Jesus to heal me during this convention. He said, I, I want to be healed. He said, this accident I had, that he was injured in an accident. He said, it, it not only injured my back, uh, it's destroyed my life. I can't drive a truck anymore. He said, I'm behind in my house payments. He said, after the meeting tonight, I'm to call my wife and find out whether we have to move out next week or not because we're so far behind on the mortgage. He said, it's just that accident just, I'm not only crippled physically, it crippled my whole life. I want to be healed. That man, I looked at him, I knew, I saw faith in that man's eyes. I said, you know, I believe you're going to get healed. And that night, at the close of the message, I was praying for people. And, and others were praying for people. And I saw him from the back. Of, we were way up in the mountains in a, a Methodist retreat, <laughs> a facility. Of course, people were there from many different denominations and all full gospel businessmen. And he was uh, in the back, of the, the church, the back of the meeting room with the cane and his back brace. And I saw him take that back brace off. And he walked down there with that cane like that. And uh, I just finished praying for someone. He stood in front of me. He said, you going to pray for me now? And I said, I sure am. He took that stick, that walking stick, 
It was like God gave him supernatural strength and he snapped it over his knee like a toothpick or something. You know, he just snapped it over his knee. I, I, I prayed for him and uh, he straightened up. You could just, you could see when God just, he said he could feel hands reaching in his back and doing that on his vertebra. He could literally feel, it was the hand of the Lord. Because I was standing in front of him, you know, it was the hand of the Lord. He grabbed me and I'm not a small person. He lifted me up off the floor and started dancing in the Holy Ghost, holding me up off the floor and totally healed by the power of the Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He knew what he wanted. He wanted to be healed. We were ministering in another area of New Mexico. I was a year or two later. He came to the meeting and gave a testimony. He was still totally healed. Totally healed. To God be the glory. I'm telling you, that man, his name was Daryl Sands. He knew, Daryl knew what he wanted. Amen. Then in verse 52, then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Faith changes a person. This man was no longer, not only was he no longer blind, he was no longer a beggar sitting by the road. He became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Jesus was on his way to the cross. That road led to the cross that he was on. He not only received his, his sight, he received a new way of life. He was made well, not only physically, but spiritually because of his faith. Amen. So faith changes a person. And many times when, when, when we ask God for one of his promises, we trust in him by faith, we'll receive even more than we're asking for because he's able to do a exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think by his power that works through us. Amen. Amen. He was made well. I was thinking of that. I was thinking of, of the function of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in Luke chapter 4 verse 18, he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Born Emmaus no doubt was poor. Of course, everyone without Jesus is poor. But I mean, no doubt he was, he was poor. He was a beggar begging uh, for food, for, for money, whatever he could get. That anointing, the Holy Spirit, on our Savior, it delivered him from poverty. He was no longer poor. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Can you imagine how broken that man's heart was? Having been blind, no doubt. Having been abused and used, his broken heart was healed that day. He said, he has, he has sent me to heal the broken uh, hearted, uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He was held captive by that condition that he was in. And he re received his sight, not only physically, but spiritually. He was enlightened because of what happened to him that day. So he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Can you, we can only imagine the oppression that would come with that kind of blindness where a person's having to beg for a living there with a, a cup and just sitting by the roadside, uh, no sight, brokenhearted, poor, oppressed, but he met Jesus. Amen. <laughs> and his faith caused Jesus to stand still. And all of these things that we read about that are the function of the anointing, associated with the anointing, happened to Barnabas. Not just him receiving his sight, but all of these other things. The last thing is to, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. Barnabas found salvation that day in Jesus Christ. Amen. He was saved on credit. Jesus was going to the cross to pay the price for his salvation. Amen. 
Glory to God. And that same anointing is on you. It's on the church. It's on all of us, uh, individually and collectively, if we'll only believe. Amen. Praise God. He was made well through and through. The Lord is, con is concerned about the, the total person, spirit, soul, and body. So Barnabas received more than just a physical healing. He received a spiritual healing, an emotional healing. He was healed through and through. Maybe you're watching by internet or maybe you're here in the, the, the church and you're thinking, you know, I need to know who Jesus is. I need to be able to call on Jesus with faith the way Barnabas did. You know, it all begins by accepting him for who he is and receiving him as one's personal Lord and Savior. As I said earlier in the message, uh, God is not limited by anyone's weaknesses. He's only limited by our decisions, by our choices. And I'd like to ask everyone to just bow your heads, please, also those watching by Internet. And I ask the Holy Spirit to help all of us to search our hearts and ask yourself this question. Have I truly uh, invited Jesus Christ to be my personal Lord and Savior? Have I accepted Him for who He really is? It's not enough to know about Him. God wants us to have a personal relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, His Son. If you're saying, that's what I need, I need to accept Jesus. I want to make that decision. Let me tell you, God's not limited by your weaknesses, only by your choices. If you're wanting to choose Jesus, I want you to lift your hand up high. You want to choose Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior today. Just lift your hand up high, wherever you are. Praise God. Also, it may be that you've uh, known the Lord, but you've gotten off track with Him, and you, you know there's, there's some things you need to take back to the cross. You just want to make a fresh dedication of your life to Jesus Christ. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. That's a quality decision for anyone that would like to make it. If that's you, lift your hand up high, then you can put it back down. You want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Just lift your hand up high. Then thirdly, you know, the Holy Spirit is available to all believers today. Jesus said, if you ask your father for a, a bread, will he give you a stone? How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for him? If you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit, or maybe you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, but you feel like you've gotten dry, you want more of the Holy Spirit. You, either the, that first uh, time to be filled with the Holy Spirit or to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. If that's the desire of your heart, lift your hand up high. Say, I want more of the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled overflowing with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. I want to ask those that lifted their hands, uh, if you will, to uh, get up from your seats and come up to the front of the church. Let's all stand. And uh, we invite you to come up to the front of the church because we want to have a prayer partner to personally uh, uh, stand with you and to spend time with you after the close of the service uh, praying with you further. Anita, would you stand with Lupe? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. And uh, I w wonder, uh, Charles, would you and Zamina mind uh, standing with this precious one. And, and, and uh, let's all say this, this prayer together to encourage these that have come forward. Also, we know we have many people that watch us over the internet. And uh, we had a report last week of, of there, there's a ministry in one country that's been downloading our messages and showing them uh, in different villages. And it's in a country where people can be killed for preaching the gospel. It's an Islamic country. And we had a report last week where 77 people, I believe it was, accepted Jesus with the showing of one of the messages from this church that they showed, they, they translated it in Urdu and play, the, uh, play it in their language while it's playing on a screen where they show it. So we know people are getting saved uh, over the internet. So let's all say this together to encourage those that may be saying it for the first time. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father have, mercy on me, have mercy on me, a sinner. A sinner. I, repent I repent for all my sins, all my sins. And, ask and ask your forgiveness. Jesus, Jesus I, accept you I accept you 
now and forever as my personal Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, take charge of my life, and make something very beautiful and very wonderful out of it. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's give Jesus a hand clap. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And Anita, I wonder if, if you and the deans would go with these precious ones in the, the kitchen area and just so you can have some uh, a place to minister to them further and uh, pray for their needs and whatever they've come up for, uh, asking for it and believe in God that that promise will be manifested. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. God bless you. We're going to be having a prayer service tonight, live on the internet at 6 central time. And we're so excited about that. If you have prayer requests, if you're watching by internet, you can go to glorychurch.com and click on that prayer request button even now. And we'll be praying over those tonight and also as they come in, uh, those that can join us. You can participate as much or little as you want to. Nobody's put on the spot, uh, but you can, uh, we, we all take part in praying all that want. If you don't want to vocalize your prayer, you can just be here agreeing with others that are praying. We, we don't put anybody on the spot. We need, uh, we need participation in this 6 p.m. Sunday evening prayer service if you can possibly come. Also, it'll be streamed live on the internet. If you can't come physically, you can watch and be in agreement with us uh, that way. Also, we'd like to let the internet audience know that at glorychurch.com, there's uh, seven free books available to you if you click on that free books button. And these books are on the table in the back, available absolutely free of charge to all of those here. Get as many as you want. Use them as a witnessing tool to hand out to others. Be sure they've got one of those cards uh, that has information on the church tucked inside there. There is a basket for love offerings to assist in printing the books if you feel led to, but whether you put anything in there or not, we want you to have the books free of charge. That's not required to give a love offering. We want you to understand they're free, free of, free of charge to use as witnessing to. And uh, I know Shar and I personally, since we uh, published uh, Love is the Greatest, we've personally given out, I know well over 2,000 copies ourselves to people all throughout this area and we've seen some people saved and some attending church as a result so uh, we're getting fruit and people people tell us that a woman in Walmart uh, just the other day she said did you were you the couple that gave me that book the other day she said we'd given it to her about a month she said I, I carried it in my pocket she said to work here at Walmart every day because I get treated all kinds of ways here at work and I run into people sometimes people are very rude and she said I pull that book out and I read it before I start my day every day I read in it it helps me to get through the day so you can be blessing people with these books that's what they're there for God bless you have a wonderful uh, rest of this Sunday and thank you so much for getting up this morning you know I want to commend you you're the remnant here this morning give yourself a hand clap for getting up and coming to church you know uh, God bless you. Thank you for your faithfulness.